Welcome to the CFA Level 1 presentation on Portfolio Management. In this lecture, I will simply provide an overview and in subsequent lectures, we will get into more details on Portfolio Management. So, let's first talk about what we mean by a Portfolio Perspective and, uh, and the very basic point of what is a Portfolio. So, a portfolio is simply a combination of your investment assets. So to give you a small example, let's say that I have shares of FFC, Hubco, and I have a small property in defense. So this is a investment plot that I have uh, purchased in, in defense and I have some cash in the in in my uh, brokerage account so the combination of all these items is referred to as my portfolio in simplistic terms a portfolio is the combination of an investors um, uh, investments so to speak okay so that's the basic definition of a portfolio the concept of diversification is extremely important. This simply means that when one creates a portfolio, one should try and diversify, which means one should try to include different investments in one's portfolio. And the curriculum explains the concept of diversification with the example of people who worked for Enron in the 1990s. I am going to simply talk about this from my own personal experience. In the 90s, I worked for Oracle Corporation in the US and in the 90s, this company was doing extremely well. So people working around me uh, saw this company that's doing extremely well and the stock price was going up, everything was looking generally rosy. So most of us invested all our uh, retirement fund. So the company had a, had a defined contribution plan, which I've talked about earlier. And most of us at Oracle invested our uh, pension plan in the Oracle stock. So this was well and good as long as the stock was going up. But in 1999, uh, actually closer to 2000, the Oracle stock came crashing down. And those of us who had invested, uh, essentially put uh, all our eggs in the, in the Oracle basket, lost a tremendous amount of money. So this illustrates what happens if one does not diversify. Okay, in general, portfolio management talks about the importance of diversification, which means one should have investments in different areas so that if maybe one investment is going down, another is going up, another is staying flat, so that just because one investment does terribly, your overall portfolio is still acceptable. We'll talk about this in more detail soon. Another important point uh, from a portfolio perspective is that we must evaluate individual investments by their contribution to the risk and return of an investor's portfolio. So the point being this, let's say an investment's portfolio has five assets, A, B, C, D, and E. And we are evaluating whether or not to add a sixth investment called F to this portfolio. Now, one way of evaluating F is to look at the expected return of F and the riskiness of F measured in terms of uh, its variability. Another impact, and but, the, but what this statement is saying is that rather than look at F individually, we should see what would happen if we were to add F to the portfolio then what is the impact of adding F to the portfolio on the expected return of the portfolio and the standard deviation of the portfolio? If the addition of F improves these numbers, then F is a good security to add. If, if on the other hand, F reduces the, the, uh, these numbers or makes them worse, 
then uh, it's a bad investment key point being we must evaluate investments on the basis of what they do to the portfolio uh, and finally for this slide when we talk about uh, a portfolio perspective the Markowitz framework uh, developed by um, by this famous person called Markowitz basically told us that tells us that we should look at standard deviation as a measure of risk before this uh, before this work people were very unclear about how to measure risk while everybody understood that risk meant uh, uncertainty but the question was how do we measure it and the answer comes here that one good way of measuring risk is by using the standard deviation so essentially we are saying that for a given investment let's say if we have an expected return of 10 percent then the riskiness of this is based on how how much further away from 10 percent can the various returns be so simplistically put if you have two investments a and b so investment a gives you a return of uh, eight let's say eight percent and investment b gives you a return expected return of 12 percent but the potential range of values for investment b is much higher that means the standard deviation of investment b is more and the riskiness hence of investment b is more bottom line use standard deviation as a measure of risk that's what mr markowitz said okay continuing with the portfolio perspective you need to understand this concept of the diversification ratio which is simply the risk of equally weighted portfolios of uh, portfolio of n securities divided by the risk of a single security selected at random so let me explain this through an example and this is new in the 2011 curriculum so i think it's uh, important from a exam perspective let's say that in your portfolio again you have five stocks a b c d and e so this is your overall portfolio let's say that the standard deviation of the returns of this portfolio is equal to 18 and let's say that for simplicity that the standard deviation of each individual stock in this uh, security in this uh, portfolio is 25 so standard deviation of a is 25 standard deviation of b is 25 and so on so the diversification ratio would be 18 which is the which is the standard deviation of the overall portfolio divided by the standard deviation of any one of these stocks picked at random which is 25 if uh, if we had different numbers here we would simply take the average of these numbers so this is our diversification ratio the simple point here is why is the portfolio less risky than an individual asset the reason being these assets will typically move in different directions when a is going up b might be going down c might be staying flat and so on so overall the the riskiness of this asset measured by the variation or standard deviation uh, will be less than the riskiness of individual securities and just talked about this diversification ratio and the lower this number the better if we had a if we have a diversification ratio of one that means that there is no diversification benefit and the further down we go the more diversification benefit we have but we should keep in mind that this is an approximate measure in the real world we use computer optimization to find the appropriate weightages of the different uh, shares in a portfolio or the different investments and we also use computer programs to figure out what investments to have and so on so let's talk about this concept of correlation briefly here and then we'll see it in more detail later if you take two stocks a and b and these stocks generally don't move together 
then we say that the correlation between these stocks is low and to create a diversified portfolio ideally you want stocks or investments with a relatively low correlation but one one limitation that has been observed especially during the recent uh, financial crisis is that during times of financial crisis the correlation between various investments increases significantly and when the correlation between investments increases significantly that means that if one investment is going down then the other investments are also going down and hence the benefit of diversification decreases okay so now that we've talked about a general portfolio perspective let's talk about investment management clients remember that as a cfa candidate you need to be thinking of yourself as a investment advisor and then if you are an investment advisor you need to know what sorts of clients you might have uh, here i would strongly encourage you to look at exhibit 14 and in the 2011 curriculum this is on page 291 so if you can open up there that's great otherwise just follow along so briefly the different types of investors that you might have uh, high at a high level there are two categories this is individual investors and all these defined benefit pension endowments foundations etc these are all referred to as institutional investors so uh, individual investors institutional investors while we will cover this material in more detail later at this stage you just need to understand briefly what are the characteristics of these different kinds of clients and we will understand their characteristics in terms of their time horizon risk tolerance income need and liquidity so i will first define these characteristics and then briefly describe what uh, what the what this column means time horizon simply means what is the typical time horizon for an investor so to give you a rough idea from an individual investor perspective a, a young person who has a good job and will say retire in 30 years has a long investment time horizon on the other hand somebody who's retiring next year and is uh, saving for retirement has a short time horizon risk tolerance refers to how much risk a uh, investor can take somebody who is going to retire in one year and will need his investment to fund his retirement has a low risk tolerance and the young person who's retiring in many many years and has a good job has a relatively high risk tolerance income needs this means how much income is needed from the investment so an investment again for the person who's just retiring once he retires his investment will be needed to generate an income from him from which he can live so from his investment the income need will be high on the other hand the young person who is simply uh, saving money will have a relatively low or possibly no income need from his investment because he has a decent enough salary liquidity needs refers to whether there are any special liquidity requirements in the near future so somebody who's maybe 45 years old and in another three years will need about hundred thousand uh, dollars to pay for his child's college education has that liquidity need for so we'll say that for him there is a liquidity need of hundred thousand in three years to pay for college education so all these terms need to be understood at least at least briefly at this stage now let's talk about different kinds of investors with individual investors i've already roughly talked about it so this is an individual client of yours and given the example i just uh, showed you or just discussed all these things actually just vary based on the individual so i gave you the example of a young person as well as a person who's just about to retire so the time horizon risk tolerance income needs liquidity varies based on your uh, based on your individual client 
a defined benefit pension so this is a possible client of yours the way you can think of this is so if you have a defined benefit pension we spoke about this briefly under the non current liabilities lecture in fra but companies that have pension liabilities need to create a pension fund and in that pension fund there will be all sorts of uh, investments so the combination of those investments is referred to as the defined bench uh, defined benefit pension the idea being that you want this portfolio to grow so that it meets the future liability now typically the time horizon for this is long term so you might have your liability due in a number of years so you want your asset to grow in order to meet that liability the risk tolerance is usually high so whenever the, usually when the time horizon is long the risk tolerance is relatively high the income needs will be high for a mature fund what this means is that if the if the liabilities are now due then the income that must be generated from this fund is relatively high on the other hand if you have a growing fund a young fund that is going to fund liabilities after many years then the then the income requirement will be relatively low the liquidity needs or special liquidity needs are generally relatively low okay so that's your defined benefit pension in terms of endowments and foundations these two are quite similar so i'll bucket these together you just need to understand the distinction large universities especially in the united states have endowment funds so these are again you know a combination of investments and uh, uh, institutions such as harvard will have a has a huge endowment fund the expenses of the universities are paid through these endowment funds so as you might imagine the time horizon is very long term the risk tolerance again is relatively high since you have a high time horizon the income the income need basically is uh, they need to these endowments and foundations need to meet the expenses of the organization so so income has to be enough to meet expenses and liquidity needs are generally quite low just to draw the distinction between an endowment and a foundation while all these characteristics are the same i already talked about the fact that when we have a university fund that's referred to as an endowment foundations me generally refers to charitable foundations so the largest foundation charitable foundation in the world probably currently is the the bill and melinda gates foundation which has assets roughly equal to about uh, 36 billion i think and there again so the the funds or the assets in the foundation's portfolio are used to meet the various projects that happen under the umbrella of that foundation so all the characteristics for foundation and endowment are generally the same so banks have a relatively short term horizon the point being that extra cash that banks have needs to be invested but depositors can come dema- demand their money any time so investments cannot be locked in for a long time time horizon is short uh, the risk tolerance is generally low the last thing you want a bank to do is invest all its money in high risk uh, endeavors because if the market goes down then that will be terrible for the bank the income needs would generally be the income that is necessary to pay the interest on on deposits and so on as well as to cover operational expenses and and w- the liquidity needs will generally be high because depositors can come and ask for their money any time investment companies here generally refers to uh, actually let's first talk about insurance companies so insurance companies generally are broken into two categories 
one is property and casualty and the other is life insurance the time horizon is typically long the the risk tolerance is typically the risk tolerance is typically low actually let me just qualify the time horizon the time horizon is typically long for uh, life insurance companies and typically short for property and casualty risk tolerance for insurance companies is generally low income needs generally quite low and liquidity needs generally high because these insurance companies have to meet insurance claims whenever they come in investment companies refers to mutual fund type companies the time horizon uh, varied varies depending on the on the type of fund the risk tolerance also varies and the lick, uh, the so so income needs also vary and liquidity needs are generally high to meet redemptions so these are different kinds of uh, institutional investors and their rough characteristics at this stage as long as you know this material that's good enough this stuff is covered in a tremendous amount of detail in level 3 so i will discuss this with more detail with you at a later point in time at this stage just understand this uh for your information just one more kind of fund that's mentioned in the curriculum but not shown in exhibit 14 is this concept of a, a sovereign wealth fund so as you probably know by now sovereign stands for country so sovereign wealth fund would mean that some countries that have a lot of extra money uh, such as uh, such as say uh, abu dhabi so they will invest their extra funds in a sovereign wealth fund and since i did mention abu dhabi the total assets of uh, the abu dhabi sovereign wealth fund according to the cfa curriculum are about 627 billion dollars so that's a huge amount of money invested around the world